Salutations and welcome to the 11th episode of the Gamers Experience. I believe it's number 11. My name is Phil Willis and if you're not familiar, the Gamers Experience is a journey of me going through some of my favorite games and I'm starting with my top 100 PC games of all time in chronological order of date of release. We are up to number 11, Dark Sun. Ooh. Uh, D and D uh, game for those who don't know, and I'm excited to talk about this one because you know a lot of people. I've talked to a number of people who know about the Gold Box games. Not that there's a ton of them, uh, but uh, there, there's also some. Of course, there's a ton of people who played Baldur's Gate. But what a lot of people don't know is that in between that there was a uh, uh, there was a number of other uh, second edition games, uh, computer adaptations that had uh, come out. And so this show and the next show is going to be talking about uh, those, a couple of them anyways. Uh, there was quite a few of them, really. I'm just going to talk about a couple of my favorite ones uh, that I have access to anyways. One of them that I don't have access to, because uh, GOG hasn't released it yet, and I'm crossing my fingers, is a game called Star Jammer. So, uh, and that one was using, it looked like a gold box game, but it was set in outer space, and you could have ship, uh, spaceship to spaceship battles. They would look like something, uh, they look like normal ships on the, you know, ocean ships, but they're in space. Uh, it had very interesting uh, set of rules. Uh, but today we're here to talk about uh, Dark Sun, which was released in 1993 uh, by Strategic Simulations Incorporated, the same guys who brought you uh, the Gold Box uh, series. And it's a single player um, RPG experience. It also come, uh, there was also an expansion, uh, Wake of the Ravager. Uh, that's out there as well uh, but we're focusing uh, on the first game today uh, it takes place in uh, in a fictional land of, of Athlas, a uh, dying and hostile uh, desert world um, and you're in a city state that's ruled by a powerful sorcerer king uh, nearby are several free uh, cities surviving in the desert uh, thanks to the hard work of their citizens um, so uh, the, the the sorcerer king he's working on a pyramid and he wants to make a great sacrifice of blood by sweeping the desert and destroying the inhabitants of the cities under his control. Because why, why not? It'll make some great sun god happy. Uh, you will be playing a party of four gladiators uh, condemned to fight uh, in the arena until you die. Um, so naturally, your party's first order of business is to escape. But then you're going to uh, go out and, and unite uh, the people to stand up uh, in those free cities to stand up against this guy before he decides to crucify and sacrifice all of their children and aunts and uncles and grandparents and the such. So, uh, sounds super, super exciting. Um, let's see here. So, as I often like to do, uh, I like to show you, uh, well, first I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, where I came in on this. Uh, when this game came out in 1993, I couldn't afford it, and my rig computer at the time could not run it. I didn't get my hands on this one until probably a good four years later as part of a, as part of a collection uh, in the such. And I was really, really impressed with, uh, with you know, how it, it handled uh, combat in the such. And we're going to talk about that when we're actually uh, playing it here in a few minutes. Uh, it also runs off of a totally different uh, set of rules as we're going to discover as we walk through the instruction book. It's still D&D &D under the helm. Uh, you still got your, you know, a lot of your common classes like fighter and rogue. But you got some you may not recognize like preserver, which is essentially the wizard class. Uh, and you got, when it comes to clerics, you've got elemental domains that you pick from that give you elemental spells, which is really cool. All characters have some access to psionics. Uh, and there's a class called a psionicist, which has access to all of the schools of psionics. So uh, there's a lot of magic and magic-like abilities uh, under the hood of this game. Plus, you've got a lot of interesting and different races that you don't have in your typical uh, fantasy game. So uh, that's pretty cool and awesome. And we're gonna we're gonna dive into that a little bit by looking underneath the helm. So let me shrink my picture here. 
We're just going to bring that over here and look at this instruction book together. Too bad they don't have the cover art on this one. Not sure what happened with that. It goes right into the table of contents. And of course, uh, this is what you get from GOG. You will get the PDF of the instruction book, which you will need because like any of these D&D games, uh, there's a lot of complicated and somewhat arbitrary uh, rules uh, that you'll want to be aware of. So uh, I like to read y'all the introduction here. The World of Dark Sun. Athos. Ath <clears throat> sorry. Athos? Athos? Whatever. The world of Dark Sun was once as pleasant as any other, but after many thousands of years, powerful mages found ways to gain power through draining the planet's vitality. At their zenith, these wizards caused the sun to transform into a pleasant yellow glow from a pleasant yellow glow to a raging crimson fireball on the horizon. The seas evaporated and were replaced with huge basins of salt. Mines played out, rendering metal extremely rare and valuable. Scarcer still were any sources of water. Um, the creatures of Atlas were twisted by the free use of magic. They constantly adapted to the harsh conditions. New monsters emerged from the deep desert to plague the remnants of man. Now, the only stable concentrations of humanity are in tightly controlled city-states. Without exception, these are ruled by the vicious sorcerer kings, the last remnants of the wizards who depleted Atlas. These kings call themselves gods and rule through a religious organization known as Templars. Their rule is uniformly harsh and capricious, and a larger proportion of the populace is enslaved. Only the strongest can feel any measure of safety because the Templars can condemn anyone without a trial. The few places with any freedom are isolated villages founded by escaped slaves. Though free, life in the wasteland is precarious. Water supplies can fail, marauding monsters can devastate a village, and slavers are a constant threat. Until these tiny villagers can look beyond day-to-day -day survival and ally with one another, they are unlikely to survive more than a few years. Shatterlands takes place in and around the city-state of Draj, ruled by the Sorcerer King. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. Look at that name. Holy cow, there's a lot of letters in that name. Tektu Kitale? Uh, we'll just call him Mr. T. Ruled by the Sorcerer King, Mr. T! So, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Um, and then it tells you that the game comes with a pre-made party if you don't uh, want to make your own party. Uh, there is some background here. Uh, the D&D games, of course, are known for their, their depth. And, and a lot of it was in the instruction books in those old days because you can only fit so much on the screen. Now, by the time we're getting to 1983, I can't remember if this was originally a CD-ROM game. Probably not. Uh, but you are getting to like higher density disk and hard drive installs. So uh, they were able to put more and more text into the games. But with that being said, you still got uh, some of that text there. Uh, right right in that and then we got instructions about how to walk around now this game is also where D&D well, D's always had some uh, adventure elements to it like puzzly adventure -y type stuff but you're getting more and more into that in some ways this starts to feel like a point and click adventure game as you're going to see during the gameplay itself uh, but as you can just looking at these icons like talk use pick up look very much like you're playing a laser suit larry game or something uh, and then it's telling you about creating your, your party here. And we're going to go through creating some uh, characters together. So uh, that'll be exciting. So we flip through the pages. Uh, you got the uh, inventory management system that's very uh, reminiscent of the earlier Dungeon Hack games we were playing with the, with the little slots over here and all the different slots on the body uh, and the such. So very familiar if you've been playing through these things in order. Uh, and then it's telling you about how to cast spells, which I want to show you more of that in the game, and then going into what all the different attribute scores mean to you. Then we get to the races, and that's where you really see some uh, divide between this game and the earlier games, like the Dungeon Hacks games. You have Half Giants, for example. Uh, these guys are huge and strong, uh, standing between 10 and 12 feet tall, weighing in the neighborhood of 1,600 pounds. Their features are human but exaggerated, uh, and they make great meat shields. I, I mean fighters and gladiators and the such. So uh, the one thing, it doesn't go into too much crunchy detail in these initial sections, but I can tell you from playing the game, uh, they all, they'll all have a crap ton of hit points, but they have lower armor class too because they're so big 
and easy to hit. Uh, of course, you're used to halflings and humans, but then you get to mules, which are the incredibly tough crossbreed of humans and dwarves. Um, I not really use mules a whole lot because they just look too much like the, the, the other class or other races to me. But then you get to the Thrykreen, which are insect-like looking creatures. They are at least human in appearance of all races. They are insectoids, six-limbed creatures with tough sandy yellow exoskeletons standing seven feet tall at the shoulder with two large eyes, two antennae, and a small powerful jaw. They are always female. Thrykreen may can use the chakra. Um, I'm sure I butchered that. A crystalline throwing wedge, uh, the chattaka or whatever, can be thrown up to 90 yards and still remain, uh, still return to the thrower. If it misses the target, when it hits, it inflicts 3 to 9 points of damage. Thrykreen cannot use armors, cloaks, belts, boots, or rings due to their non-human shape. They can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, clerics, psionicists, and multi-class characters. So... I haven't used those a whole lot either, so I don't have a strong opinion on them. And then we get to the classes. Uh, you also got a new class here that you don't normally see uh, with the Gladiator. Uh, they are uh, they are essentially um, uh, another type of fighter. It says they're slave warriors of the city-states, especially trained for brutal physical contests, disciplined in many diverse forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and skilled in dozens of weapons. They're the most dangerous warriors. They cannot cast spells. Though they can use any type of magical weapons and armor, uh, at 5th level they get an extra AC bonus because they optimize that armor so well. Uh, and uh, they gain speed with experience and do more attacks just like fighters do. So, sounds like a more beefier, slightly more beefier version than fighters. Uh, but uh, then we have good old fashioned rangers, and well, those who play these games are pretty familiar with those. Uh, then we get to Preservers, which is essentially the game's version of Wizards. Uh, I've always just thought of them as Wizards. I didn't see anything jumping out at me when I was playing them or reading this that made me think they step out that much different to regular D&D Wizards, aside from the fact that they can use Psionics, uh, like every other uh, class really in this game who has decent uh, wisdom or intelligence scores. Uh, then we have our, our Clerics, and as I mentioned before, uh, you know they can use... Um, they're more of elemental clerics, worshiping elements rather than worshiping deities. Uh, they choose, uh, they choose, uh, it says here, clerics are priests who choose to worship one of the four elemental spheres. This choice dictates what spells they can call upon and what types of weapons they can use. Clerics have major access to the sphere of influence that they worship. They have minor access to the sphere of cosmos. This means they can cast any spell within their own sphere and can cast cosmos spells of third or less, level or less. However, clerics cannot cast any spells from spheres they do not belong to. They generally prefer to leave combat to fighter types, but when necessary, they can fight in melee. Um, they're all trained in combat. Uh, they're not restricted with regards to what armor they can wear, so that's a little different. They can, they can wear the highest forms of armor, unlike the regular games, where they're kind of limited to banded. Uh, they can only use weapons associated with their sphere, so that can give you some different weapon combinations than what you had in the older games where they were limited to blunt weapons. Uh, a cleric of the air is restricted to missile weapons because they fly through the air. Totally logical, right? Water clerics can only use weapons of bone or wood because they are organic materials through which water once flowed. Clerics who associate with spheres of earth and fire have the most choice uh, of which weapons to use. I like fire anyways. I just like burning things. So I always I always go with clerics of fire. That, that's just me. Um, you have your, your druids here. Uh, unlike D&D &D druids, they have no restriction to what weapons they can use, but they're not allowed to wear armor. Uh, though they can wear bracers and stuff like wizards can. So keep that in mind. Then you have your rogues, your standard rogues. Then you have psionicists. And uh, they can... Uh, most characters have access to one of the three psionic disciplines, which is psychokinesis, psychometabolism, and telepathy. Um, I don't know why there's no pyrokinesis, because that's actually the best kind, but setting things on fire is always fun. So those are the major changes uh, from the earlier games as far as just the crunchy D&D &D rules underneath the helm. And then it goes through all the different uh, monsters that you're going to face, and you are going to find some monsters unique uh, to uh, this game. I don't remember finding too many genies, for example, in the gold box games. Um, or sat outs, otherwise known as rampagers. Uh, those are fierce little creatures. 
So you'll definitely see uh, some, some things in there. And they give you a lot of good uh, detail on a number of these. And it, pay, it, it helps to pay attention to some of, this, uh, some of this stuff so that when you fight these guys or you meet them for the first time, you kind of have an idea of what you're going up against. This is more detailed than what we got in a lot of the other D&D &D instruction books. So it's pretty cool uh, that they take some time to, to give you uh, some of that good crunch underneath the uh, hood, uh, even giving you uh, their, their statistics. You could actually run a D&D &D game off of this uh, by itself. Then we go into all the different uh, spells, of course, that you're gonna that you're gonna get. Many of them familiar to those of us who played uh, D and D, uh, but then you're gonna get a couple of uh, unique ones uh, in here. Uh, Turn pebble to boulder, for example. That's not in the gold box game, um, but yeah, throw that and knock somebody upside the head. So that's pretty cool. Wall of fire and wall of ice, I believe, make their introduction in this game because I don't remember seeing those in the gold box games. You could go, guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you even get the, the cool 5th level spells here, uh, like Cloud Kill. Everybody loves Cloud Kill. Great for wiping out lots of weak characters. Uh, then we're getting to uh, some of the 4th and 5th level cleric spells here. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Huh. Cure spells are part of the Cosmos uh, dealy. Uh, kind of keep that in mind if you want to cure a lot. And then we get to psionics and, uh, and, and psychokinetic uh, sciences and devotions. These are different skills uh, that you can learn uh, and, and the such. So uh, essentially, this is a free group of spells that every character gets uh, to a greater or lesser degree, depending on those statistics that affect psionics. Um, but, uh, and, but if you're a full-blown psionicist, then you, you get to learn the most and you can use them most effectively. So, and then we get to our get to our tables here, and we're all familiar with those uh, D and D tables. I don't see anything here in the book that points out that certain uh, classes are limited and how high level they can go, like we did see in the gold box games. I'm not sure if that's something that the Dark Sun rule set in the universe eliminated. I I haven't wanted to test this out on my own, so I tend to stick to uh, a lot of humans, but. Um, uh, when I do pick some of those other classes, I haven't hit a ceiling yet. So maybe that has gotten rid of, maybe they've gotten rid of that. Y'all can tell me you can, if you know the answer to that question. So that's, that's the rule book. Now we're ready to just about uh, jump into the game here, but I thought y'all would like to take a look through that. And, and also if you get the, if you get the GOG game, uh, the the game does come with a hint book as well because there will be there's a couple places where you may get stuck because it does have that adventure game element that I'm not super super fond of the go and find this key hiding in a stack of hay that will help you get over there so to speak um, that can be a little irritating but uh, that's where the hint book will help you out a lot as well and it is a really really fun adventure and story because uh, the scope and getting out there and helping other uh, people bring together to come against the the, the 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 desert king so or the sorcerer king so we're gonna go ahead and jump into this and and as normal you can expect the the screen to flash a bit while i load this guy up here so give me just one moment I'll load that up that always takes a second there or two to load We have like instant loading and things these days with our hard drives are pretty fast. I mean, for a game this, you know, this old, but I think it just likes to simulate the, uh, the time. By the way, I forgot to mention earlier, but uh, yes, you can see everyone. I've got this brand new, beautiful microphone. So hopefully that's making the audio portion of these gamers experience a little bit better for you guys to enjoy. Let me know what you think. It is very pretty and shiny, if nothing else. Uh, but anywho, uh, so we got the game loaded up here. I've muted it for just a second here. I'm going to turn on the volume uh, in, in a moment uh, so you can kind of hear the, the music that's going on. Um, well, just go ahead and jump into it. Here we go. Kind of got a rocking beat to it.
So, uh, I like to start off making my own uh, characters, and that's always part of any uh, awesome D&D experience. Uh, the big, big difference between a lot of JRPGs and WRPGs is you can make your own characters in a lot of WRPGs, and you're kind of limited to a few games like Final Fantasy 1 <laughs> that lets you do it there. So, go ahead and pick new, and you'll have... Uh, you know, you'll have the, your character creation screen right here. If you right click and left click, you'll scroll through the different uh, race and gender combinations. So there's your, your giant, and he's so big, he can't even fit in the picture unless he's hunched down, which I think is funny. Uh, and the such. The, the halfling looks kind of like a miniature version of a Klingon to me. But that's just, it looks like a little wild child gnome uh, as well. But, uh, you, you know, usually I like you. Of course, you want your frontline dude. It looks at first like all these are grayed out. But if you just click on the one that's by default, a lot of these will open up. And you go ahead and pick what you really want. Like the gold box and dungeon hack games and the such before it, you can roll for your statistics by clicking on the dice. And it'll mix all these guys up for you. Or uh, if you're like me and you like overpowered characters because you don't like dying uh, then you can go ahead and tweak these out now i remember in the gold box games if you max all these guys out that could actually cause the game to get ridiculously hard it had like some sort of mechanism in there for people who were just completely uh creating overpowered cheating thingies so that kind of makes me not want to max out every single thing but you can see here that um wisdom and intelligence affects your uh, psionic points down here. So these are psionic points, and of course these are your hit points. So something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, you can go ahead and give him a different name if you want. I think Killer is a fine name for a gladiator. So we'll hit done on that guy there. Go ahead and make our, our next one. Which, like someone to kind of uh, share the, uh, the front lines with that uh, fighter or whatever that can be. Did I, did I make that last guy a gladiator or a fighter? No, I don't remember. But go for cleric. They usually make decent frontline uh, defenders, if nothing else, in between casting spells uh, and the such. And of course, with clerics, you, you generally want you know kick-ass wisdom uh, and good uh, dexterity. Go ahead and max out their hit points too. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I went with with fire. Oh, by the way, forgot to mention there's a view psionics option down here. And you can pick which uh, which one of these uh, you know they're gonna go with. Usually, for somebody on the front lines, you want metabolism, which I did not do with my gladiator. Whoops. Uh, we want to get that hit points. Yeah, there we go. I think that's pretty good. Oh, I didn't even change this race though. Um, yeah, a lady person on the front lines. That's fine. Go back for our fire again. For some decent scores and get her in there now as you can tell at this point if you're i turned it down so it doesn't drive you crazy but if you're listening to that background music it really does get into this loop uh i will not pretend that the soundtrack in this game is awesome it actually just loops over and over again it eventually drives me crazy and i just either ignore it or turn it down okay so we have fire and stuff uh, we got a cleric, Zulak, kind of a silly name. <laughs> there we go. Make something pretty easy there. Like usually to have a, a roguish uh, type on the party, in case we have to pick locks and the such. And we'll oftentimes pick those little guys for that. So, I'll go for the mini Klingon. Why not? And then he gets um, 22 dexterity, which gives him an arm class of 5, which is an all-time low as far as I know. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I like metabolism for them as well. Give him a good constitution so they, the poor little guy can have lots of hit points. He's going to need them. So, that's eh, fine. Get done. Notice how also 
the strength scores don't have the parentheses like 18 parentheses 50. Um, it just goes from 18 to 19, which I'm totally happy with. That was something the later editions pretty much got rid of anyways. And then we have a new guy here. And this is, you know, we want to put our wizard wizard type, uh, our preserver. Um, I don't know what class I go with. An elf, probably. Go with our elf preserver. Hopefully they're not limited on levels. Obviously intelligence being the kind of the kicker there. Not a lot of hit points, which is what you kind of expect from wizards. To make them a mind reader, why not? Uh, da, 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 da. That's a fine name. So there we go, there's, there's our party. And we're ready to uh, start the game here in just a moment. By order of the mighty and omnipotent king, Mr. T, all slaves fit to carry a sword shall fight in the arena. Death shall be a gladiator's payment for weakness. Let the games begin! So it's pretty cool because this game gets you right into the combat system. Um, get a little cutscene here. As you can see, Tiger has decided to join me on commentary. Hey, go out and fight, fight, fight. But I like how the game gets you right into combat, which shows one of its strengths right off. Uh, the combat system is pretty cool. And it's it's kind of a mix between what we got in the Gold Box games and what we got with Baldur's Gate. It's in between there, and I'll show you how after a minute here. We have to go through a, a little bit of a cutscene. This day, the mage Kelgor will battle a fearsome rampager. Watch and enjoy. Do not worry, killer. Your turn will come soon. Stand back and watch the battle. This poor old wizard's just thrown out there by himself. Hits him with a nice fireball, though. Yeah, those ravagers don't seem like something you really want to mess with. Yeah, he's going to need some more fireballs. Oh, unfortunately, wizards don't have too many hit points. And, and that, what's really interesting is that battle, I swear, every time I play this game, it unfolds a different way. I mean, as far as how he dies. He does die, poor wizard, every single time. Um, that's okay, we're going to go and fight this dude now. I kind of wish I picked the half-giant, actually. I play with the half-giant, he's much bigger and more intimidating looking than this fighter gladiator dude. So you get into combat mode. And in the gold box games, you might remember everything was kind of on a grid. Uh, this one feels a little more free flowing. Obviously there's no grid here um, uh, and the such. So uh, uh, let's see here. If you right click while you're on the guy whose turn it is, you'll go through a couple different options. In order to guard, you gotta use the look at option, I think. Uh, cast spells, view inventory. Okay, maybe not. I gotta remember how to do this in terms of the game. I just want him to... Oh, I think I just pressed G for guard. <laughs> Oop, they got to the wizard fast, which was, I was hoping, not gonna happen. I believe this is the cleric, so we're gonna see what kind of spells she can cast. Click on the eyeball, cast spell. We've got bless, curse, cost light wounds, and then one of my personal favorites, entangle. Because D&D &D is all about crowd control, and that's where you see another big difference here with the gold box games, and even with Baldur's Gate. This game shows you exactly where the spell is going to take place. And uh, because it's turn-based and the spells pretty much execute right away, uh, you've got full control over your magic and who it impacts. Unlike, let's say, Baldur's Gate, where I would start casting, it takes some time, everyone moves around, and then it hits the wrong people, which drives me crazy. D&D uh, &D is a tabletop game where you're supposed to have some control over what's going on. Um, you just want to be very careful about the placement here. And um, it tends to go a little bit further in those circles. So I think if I do it here, I'll still get the green guy. I'm not really concerned if I get the green guy or not. The whole point is to stop the, the rest of the pack from getting to me any sooner than, than they have to. We want to slow them down so we can pick apart one guy at a time. So you can see I've gotten a couple of my own characters there. So that guy probably isn't perfect. Um, and now it says that she's stuck. So I'm going to have her guard. 
for now. And then here's Killer, the gladiator. And we need him to kind of get up here and do his job. And try to kill this guy quickly. Yeah, 15 points there. Finisters, the uh, rogue. I think we can take a look at him, see if he's got any early inventory. He does have a quarter staff in his hand, so... Oh, wait, we're looking for Finister. He has a dagger. Longsword. So, I like how it shows you how much damage they're doing right here. A lot of them uh, don't. As we know in the gold box games, you're just kind of guessing at the damage. And we're going to move her back. That's the Cleric. Not too far back, but just want her to kind of be behind the action here. Huh, seems to be moving a little slow. But as you hear from the background music, it just loops and it loops and it loops. Kind of irritating. Uh, let's see here. But if we go to her... If you click down here, you can go to her psionics. And we have some... Ballistics, which is just a fancier version of Magic Missile. These gladiators are tough, aren't they? As we kill our first monster. Uh, we're going to have him guard or wait. Uh, we're going to move this squishy wizard away from the entanglement. Hmm. This thing is kind of going slow, and I'm not super sure why. I think there's a way to speed that up, too. Let's say control F12. Yeah, that'll get us some faster cycles there. And we'll just have her cast a spell, because she's a wizard, and that's what they do. We have Magic Missile, we have Grease, we have Shield, Wall of Fog. Superior Invisibility, Ego Whip, Intellectual Fortress, Mind Blank, and Psionic Blast. And if you just right-click on these, it'll tell you um, what exactly it does. So, that seems like a fun one. Make them think they lost 80% of their hit points. I think it said Psionic Power Check Failed. So I know it does a check when you try to do those psionics, and if it fails, you lost the opportunity. We have killer guard, and when you guard, if someone comes close to you, you automatically attack, so that's kind of cool. As you see here, she used up some of her psionic points from that failure. I'm going to try that again on the guy who's getting kind of close here. <laughs> he feels like he lost like 15 of his 20 hit points. That's hilarious. Let's see if we can get rid of the rest of those points. Ugh, oh, only two points. Uh, we want to move Finster a little further back. And then we'll have him guard. Have her cast again. Ballistic attack. Try to take the rest of this guy out. Maybe they're acceptable gladiators after all. Ha ha. Of course we are. I like how that one bug does some sort of... I don't know if that's a psionic attack. If it is, he'll run out points eventually. I don't think he's doing too much damage. Let me take a look at her hit points. 8, 11. Not the best in the world, but she is a wizard. We can have her is move further back. Yeah, I think I got caught again. We'll have our rogue and our gladiator really close to the front, guarding. Now, if you remember in the gold box games, one of my favorite things to do is take the rogue behind an enemy and backstab him for extra damage, and that seems to still work here. We've done that before. But see, this is the beauty of the entangle spell. It, it slows them down. They come to you one at a time. Uh, again, D&D, &D, a lot of it, uh, casting is all about crowd control. Uh, especially when you're dealing with large amounts of monsters like this. 
You have the cleric get to the front. They usually have decent AC. And there goes another one. I don't know if she had two attacks around or what, but she gets to hold. See, so yeah, that bug probably ran out of spell points, so now he has to come up. Huh. Let me move him down one spot. So you can kind of feel like there's a little grid, you know, underneath of there going on. You can almost picture it in your head. Great. He got caught. Go get him, killer. Squish that bug. Yeah, that'll show that bug who's boss. The crowd yawns. A few are still awake to applaud. Uh, sorry for the delay. I was just resting my eyes. Attention, glares. Go back to the pens to heal your wounds. The citizens of Dredd grow impatient with delays. I wouldn't suggest waiting for the monsters to die of old age as an entertainment tactic. Citizens of Dijon, these pathetic, uh, wretched, sorry excuses for gladiators are not our only entertainment. Do not worry. Real warriors will be fighting later today. Do you want to yell something back at the announcer? Yes or no? Um, no for now, because I don't want the show to go on for too long, but I want to say if you love it, or yes, I think you get into another fight. Um, but, yeah, what the hell. Pathetic, I'll, t I'll take on your best. I'm a real warrior and I'll prove it. You're the best announcer I've ever seen. <laughs> you got like role-playing game choices, right? Well, thanks. Okay. If you say, I think some of the other things to him, you'll get into another fight. And you might want to, uh, later on you have to go back anyways and do some more fighting. Uh, but it's a good way to level up. Because uh, you're going to be able to go back in here and rest anyways. Do you wish to continue? Answer yes. Please wait. So now we're going back into uh, back into the to the slave pen barracks. Please guard the slave pens. I'm Kurzak, leader of the guards. Follow me. I'm here to lead you to your cell. Hey, you've got options. You've got lots of options. Of course, I always like this. Oh, tell me about your job. It's like it's an interview. Tell me about your job. Guard work is pretty routine. I take them to the arena. Sometimes I bring them to the pens. It beats working on a pyramid. Who is the half giant? Oh, that's the monster trainer. His name is Le Crusha. He's not too bright, but he's good with monsters. How many slaves have escaped? No one escapes. Keep in line or else. How well guarded are the exits? The only exit you'll see is that monster that kills you. Working on the pyramid? Yeah, that's where most of the people are working. Why is the pyramid being built? The pyramid is being built for the Sorcerer King. Everything's been slowed down since his disappearance, but that's all you're entitled to know. Let me escape or I'll kill you. Just get moving. Your lives are to be spent fighting in the arena, not with the gods in the pens. Yes, sir. You can piss them off and fight them, but at this early stage, unless you're super lucky or super good, that tends to end in suicide. But this game does give you those choices, and that's one of the hallmarks of a good role-playing game. Choices and different paths you can go down and do and handle. Uh, and there's people who enjoy just uh, getting past those initial rush of guards. Ugh. All right, go through the door. There's a place to rest down the East Hall. I'll come get you when it's time for your next fight. If you want to fight before that, knock on the door. So you're now down here in the slave areas where there's different places. And um, it's kind of like one of those point and click adventure games you do want to kind of check out. Like, look, I can check over here in the haystack, use it. Do you want to search through it? Yes. You don't find anything of interest. But sometimes you definitely will find something of interest. And let me see. You can save... Oops. Ha. Uh, if you save, I guess that means save and exit. Not to be confused with just saving. Um, please hold on. Your game is important to us. We'll reload that real quick. Didn't really expect that to happen. Let me load back up here. Uh, let's see here. Load save game. There we go. 
It is nice that it seems to allow you to save just about anywhere. That can be pretty helpful. All right, so we're back in our pens here. And if you're when you're playing one of these DOS simulated games, uh, you know, because GOG is just using DOS box and sets up all the settings for you. Um, but, uh, if you, if you hit alt enter, it resizes the window into a normal, you know, windows window, which is really great if you want to watch TV on your, on the side or whatever, while you're playing these games. Um, but you'll notice at the top, it'll say DOS box, you know, 0.74 CPU speed X cycles. Um, and I believe the more cycles there are, the faster the game is running. One little trip that a lot of people don't know is if you hold, if you press control and F11 or 12, you'll make that number go up or down which will get that game into a sweet spot of what speed you wanted to run at uh, and the such. Because it was running a little slow for me uh, when I first started. And I think it has something to do with the fact that I'm recording because I didn't notice that before when I was playing it. So you can right click, go through the options so you get to talk your mouth and talk to Miron. Hello there, it's good to see you. Please forgive my appearance. I've been in here a while. I'm Killer. It is a pleasure, Killer. Let's talk escape. Escape? I've considered it, but I don't have much chance of succeeding by myself. Together, we could do it. I'm sick of the place. However, first we need money. Where could I find money? Well, I happen to know the location of a very valuable gem. If you find it and bring it to me, I will be able to apply the proper bribes to effect our escape. Where's the gem? It is owned by a slave named Simeon. He's chained up in the arena. It's probably still on his body. So deal, I'll be back soon. Good luck. So that's a that's our first clue, right? That's that's pretty interesting. You talk to these people and they talk back and get you stuff. Let's see if I can look at any of this stuff. No, nope. talk to this guy here. Scar's henchman. Talk to the boss. He's across the hall. I got these people just standing around waiting for me to talk to him. I don't know you. You must be the new gladiators. I'm Sky and I run these pens. Don't cross me and there won't be any trouble, understand? Maybe after a couple of more visits to the arena, we'll talk. And he pretty much cuts you short there. So you definitely get a feeling you kind of open up some more branching paths of discussion once you get through a few more gladiator fights. More Scar's henchmen that say, go talk to the boss. It looks like there are some nice trappings down here, but they're locked behind this door. The door is locked and appears to be quite sturdy. We got a body up here. Can't really do too much with that. I'll check out in this haystack. Nope. Just see here, view inventory, current spells, game menu. Let me see if we can turn uh, turn off our music. I'll just turn that rail down. It is really nice that they give you that option because boy, that music gets on my nerves after a while. But the sound effects are just fine. I'm okay with the sound effects. Turn to our game. Nothing in the haystack. Now, what do we have here? Use. Through the haystack? Yes. Killer reaches with his hand in a haystack and comes out with a crudely made bone needle. Killer receives 10 experience points. Which, that's good for Killer, I guess. He's He's got a needle. Huh. Nothing in his inventory, though. Let's see here, pick our characters. We can make uh, somebody with mm, better charisma the leader. So make her the leader. By clicking on this little, there's also computer control if you want the computer to control your characters uh, and the such. I'm not sure, let's see here. 
Does she have a healing spell so we can kind of uh, restore her hit points? There we go. Just bring that Care Light Wound spell right over there. Yay! She's got three spells left. Okay. Turn back to the game. Remember the little sun always takes you back to the game. Oh, we got this lady down here. She looks like she needs us to talk to her. Hello. Who are you and what do you want? I'm Kata. It's nice to meet you, Kata. I'm Jalal. Why are you in here? I stole a loaf of bread to feed my family. They were starving. I had no other choice. A neighbor turned me in for the reward money. His family was starving, too. How long have you been here? I've been here for a couple of months. What's all this straw for? It's what we sleep on, of course. Judge as gladly as may be respected, but we still sleep on the cold ground. Have you fought in the arena? After I was rested, I was immediately thrown to the arena with five other gladiators to fight a pack of screamer beetles. It was I was the only survivor. Luckily, I haven't fought since. What creatures did the gladiators fight? Initially, all you fight are screamer beetles and slugs. Later, they throw in some wild mules and renegade halflings at you. Whew. <laughs> the thought of killing halflings is always fun. Once you get really good, they start putting you in with things like mountain stalkers. I'm glad I never got that far. I wouldn't have survived it. What else is in the slave pens? I'm the only other person I've talked to, or the only other person I've talked to is trustee. Are there many guards here? I'm not sure. I was brought here by Kuzak, and I saw a few guards in the guard station to the north. Other than then, I'm not sure. Has anyone escaped from here? Has anyone escaped? I think I... Oh, my head, the pain. Stupid cat. Hush, nobody likes you. Cat likes to make a lot of noise. Are you all right? I don't know. I feel fine now. What happened? A sharp pain went searing through my head. And that's kind of the extent of her dialogue for the moment. Clearly, we need to get somebody to help her with her headache since they don't have Advil in this period of time. Glatty, or uh, trusty. So you're the new Glatty, the pretty scrawny. You should be thankful you're here and not in the villages. Did I ever tell you about my life before the slave pins? No, like this is the first time we're meeting you. When I was younger, uh, I was a man of the wilderness. I knew every rock between here and the raging mountains, or the ringing mountains. It was well known, too. I guided everyone, everywhere. Guided extraordinary, you might say. Where can I get some water? There's an empty water pot lying somewhere around here. Just find it and get Dinos to fill it. He can get water. How do I get to Dinos? I have a key. Go south. I'll be there in a second. Would you like to meet Dinos? Yes. And we do need to get the, the water pot. He was talking about a water pot somewhere. I thought I remember seeing something around here. I need to walk around and look for a water pot real quick. Here, water pot. Pot, pot, pot. Pot. Maybe there's one in there. Uh huh. Open that door. A breeze picks up in the room, suddenly closing the door. Oh, hell, there's undead. Or something. I don't know what the hell that is. It's a zombie. You know, I swear it looks like he just walked through the wall. But then again, it looks like I'm walking through the wall, too. Kara hears a secret door shut and lock. I swear, that's where they came in at. Oh, well. Let's see if there's anything around here. I like how you make the bed. You just make the bed. There is no handle on this side of the door. Take the hinges off the door. With a little work, you completely remove the door. Eh, you never know what you're going to find here in the pins. Like zombies. Just because zombies. They're kind of a... Oh, there's a pot. I knew I saw a pot somewhere. Get the pot and give it to her. Sorry about that little text flu right there. They're talking about uh, hide it, don't bring it out. It's 
what that kind of says. I'll take this pot to this guy. Hey, we received 200. I'm clicking too fast. Kata received 200 experience points. Because, hey, we, we got the door open. And, hey, there's water. So we will go into our inventory. Just like most action-adventure games, combine those two things. Hit yes. And now we have water. Yay, we have water. Dinos. Hi, Dinos. Did you hear someone screaming? Galala was screaming. Is she all right? She's in severe pain. No more time for talk. Take me to her at once. Well, come on, you slow-moving guy. Take you to her. Taking you to her. I walk a lot faster than he does. Dino lays his hands upon her head, concentrating. After a few minutes, she regains her senses, and he turns to leave. It worked. I must go now. We received 350 experience points. Yeah, we're just getting experience points left and right. Thank you for the help. It was uncommonly kind of you. How are you feeling? I feel great. The best I felt in a long time, thanks to Dino's. My head is perfectly clear. Yeah, who needs aspirin when you have lay on hands? What about escaping? In the northernmost monster pen, there is a secret passage which leads to the sewer entrance. It's a big hole in the northwest corner of the pens, to the west of the kitchen. You just have to push a button in the corner of the pen, and it'll open. Be careful of the guard poster there. I had to break something to distract it, but you can probably just kill him. Yeah, get to kill him. I bay as far as the desert to the north. Something startled me, and I jumped behind a rock. I fell down an embankment and broke my leg. Guards from the city found me next day. The Templar healed my leg and put some kind of memory block in my head so I wouldn't be able to tell my story to anyone. Uh, yeah. Stay well. So, like, if you come up here... Now, this is a campfire where you can rest, which is very useful for obvious reasons. We got some guys here who were talking earlier about hide something real quick. So if you come over here and you start poking your hand into their, uh, actually I like to be right here, poke their hand into the haystack, they're going to be like, search the haystack? Yes. Hey, you stay away from that or I'll kill you. Look in the hay anyways? Of course. I don't care about them. Threaten me. Of course, we would start off with the mage near the front, so we're going to move her to the back except there's no path from here great so we'll have to wait for a minute and try to get some other people moved a bit up closer to the front now i'm thinking i can get finster the rogue and this is this is one of my problem and this is the problem with Baldur's gate it just it starts with this game and it goes downhill but because there's no grid it's really hard to tell when I click on a square, exactly where he's going to land up. Exact positioning is important in Dungeons & Dragons, especially when you're talking about backstabbing with a rogue. You need to be on the exact opposite side. So if I click here, will I end up a little bit above? Will I end up right here? Or will I literally end up where I want to be, which is diagonal from, you know, like this? So that's what I'm going for. But see? See what happened there? That's exactly what I didn't want to have happen. But I kind of got around there anyways. Oh, three attacks around. Holy hell. They don't call that guy killer for nothing. Oh, hell, he's still got another turn. They don't call him killer for nothing. Sweet mercy. Uh, what not? So, well, I don't think we need really wizard on this one. These guys will kill her in the front. We'll dismantle them with their bare hands. So, you want killer right behind the rogue. I guess you got to kind of envision where his feet are going to be at. Boy, don't make them like they used to. Well, you only you need a party. All you need is killer. Wow, that was quick. And of course, after you beat them up, you can check them for goodies um, like you can anybody else. Uh, they've mostly got a bunch of you know basic weapons, which we already have. Um, so I don't really, I'll take that. What the hell? 
But now we're gonna go look in the haystack and see what we killed him over. Yeah. We created uh we 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 uh we committed murder for a bunch of copper pieces. Or ceramic pieces they're called. One hundred. We're rich. Woohoo. So that kind of gives you a, a taste there of the combat, the dialogue, the options. And, and it's a really fun adventure. Uh, the only thing I'll tell you to watch out for is there are some... Uh, there. I, uh, well, when I played this way back in the day, there were some bugs I ran into. I'm not super sure how much uh, those have been worked out. Uh, in recording this, I ran into one if I alt-tab too much, which is kind of be expected with the DOS game. Uh, if you alt-tab in the wrong spot, you, you might get frozen up on the game. So it's important to... Um, uh, to save uh, early and often uh, uh, and use different save spots, especially with an adventure type of game. You never know, you know, what's going to happen there uh, as far as being stuck down, uh, you know, because you lost an item or a key item or anything along those lines. But it is a really fun game. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's got a sequel to it as well, Wake of the Ravager. Both of them are available on uh, GOG uh, for like, I don't know, but like six bucks or something like that. Or maybe they come together. I'm going to take a look real fast for you all. Uh, we'll just take a look on GOG. Sorry, didn't mean to cover up the game. GOG Dark Sun. Let's take a look. 4.7 stars from 131 voters. Sweet. Uh, it's on sale. So it's $10, uh, but it includes both of those games. And it's on sale right now for 5 bucks. So, hell, go out and, go out and buy it. Enjoy a classic. I see a lot of people was like, hey, wow, this one game came out and it's retro. And it, it uh, apparently I took too long to get up there. So now they're calling the gladiators uh, or calling Leg Crusher to come get us the gladiators. But uh, people's like, hey, we should go play this. You know, play this game just came out and it captures the feel. Well, you can, with GOG, you can go back and you can play a lot of these old games that already have the feel because they are the old games. So I would highly encourage you to go and check those out. Uh, but if you like this video or you like to play Dark Sun, uh, let us know. Let me know. Uh, write me some comments. Tweet me out at JC Servant. Hit me up on Skype. I'm JC Servant Seven. Uh, and this is uh, this uh, this these videos uh, are. If you like these videos, you want to go on and check out RPGamer.com, where we do a podcast every few weeks called the RPG Backtrack, where we talk at nauseum about old RPGs like this. So you can go and you can check that out at RPGamer.com. Uh, come back uh, maybe in a few weeks, maybe a month, as I'm super, super busy. I just get these out when I can. And we're going to do another D&D game, and uh, we'll see maybe if you can guess what it might be. You know it Chrono actually comes after this one, and it's not Baldur's Gate, so there's not too many options here to pick from. Uh, until then, take care. <laughs>